All right, so we're in Romans chapter two, and we're gonna I'm gonna reread the first four just so we can get get it out of the way again, and make sure that I point out something that that I was kind of going around previously. I I wasn't skipping it. I just was I was forgetting to really focus on it. So. Therefore, you are inexcusable, O man, whoever you are who judge, for in whatever you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge practice the same things. But we know that the judgment of God is according to the truth against those who practice such things. And do you think this, O man, you who judge those practicing such things and doing the same, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long suffering, not know that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? Um, I think the element that I was skipping over was God reminding me when reading this that he's seeking us and our repentance. And, and not just, he, he's seeking our repentance, but not just our repentance. He's loving us to show us his repentance. And so the thing that we talked about the other day with Judas came to my mind of how does he get us to repent? How are we being led to repentance? So in that vein, I'm going to I'm going to cover really quick so uh people on the recording and Doug knows what I'm talking about about what Kurt and I talked about the other day. And that is um the story of Judas at the last supper. Um, and I, I'll, I'll paraphrase it really quick. It's found in um, uh, John chapter 13, and it's in Luke 22, I believe. And just to cover those two bases, um, which will be funny because if people are listening to the recording of of, um, of Bruce about the same time, they'll get Bruce's insight into all of that at the same time. So we are recording. We're actually we're already going. But um, you know what? I'm not going to paraphrase. Let's just jump over to it. Um, we're going to go to John 13. And we're going to come down to uh, 13. Let's see, let's go to 1320. And um, Kurt, with a mouthful of muffin, go ahead and read there at 20. 20. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever receives the one I send receives me, and whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. After saying these things, Jesus was troubled in his spirit and testified, Truly, truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. The disciples looked at one another, uncertain of whom he spoke. One of the disciples, whom Jesus loved, was reclining at table with Jesus, at Jesus' side. So Simon Peter motioned to him to ask Jesus of whom he was speaking. So that disciple, leaning back against Jesus, said to him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, It is he, it is he to whom I will give this morsel of bread when I have dipped it. So when he had dipped the morsel, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. Then after he had taken the morsel, Satan entered into him. Jesus said to him, What you are going to do, do quickly. Now one, now no one at the table knew why he said this to him. Some thought that because Je Judas had the money bag, Jesus was telling him, Buy what you need for the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. So after receiving the morsel of bread, he immediately went out, and it was night. Okay, so that's, that's in John. And then if we go Wait over... Wait a second. And didn't just like, not even two seconds before that, he said, the one that I'm going to hand this bread to is the one that I'm going to trade. We're going there. We're going there. He said that out loud, right? We're going there. Wait. We're going there. Wait. <laughs> so, we're going to jump over to Luke 22, and we will look at why no one's paying attention to that, which is why we're going to Luke. <laughs> I like Luke, if I can find it. Okay, so Found it's Luke it. 22, and if we look at... I'll read the verse, just tell me where. Yeah, Luke 22, and it is 20, let's see, 21. 21? 
But behold, the hand of him that betrayeth me is with me on the table. And truly the Son of Man goeth, as it was determined. But woe unto that man by whom he is betrayed. And they began to inquire among themselves which of them it was that should do this thing. And there was also a strife among them, which of them should be accounted the greatest. And he said unto them, The kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and they that exercise authority upon them are called benefactors. But ye shall not be so, but he that is greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and he that is chief as that doth serve. For wherever is greater, he that sitteth at meat, or he that serveth, is not he that sitteth at meat, but I am among you as he that serveth. Okay, so let's stop, stop there. So if we take these two accounts and we put them right next to each other, what happened to the fact that somebody explained that Judas was the betrayer? No one was paying attention. No one paid attention. And they got into an argument about which one of them was greater. They were so caught up. They were so caught up in, I'm greater than him, and I'm greater than him, that they didn't care. Who, who's going to kill Jesus is a little bit more, uh, you know. So here we're sitting here, we're talking, and I'm leaning up against you, and I say, I say so, so who's going to betray us? And one of us says, says it's going to be Doug. Doug's going to be the betrayer. And you're like, really? Doug's going to betray. Okay. Well, we should pray for him. Yeah. We should. We should be able. You know what? I think I'm better. I'm thinking. Mm -hmm. That's I, how it was. It, I, it's real people. I, I feel like there's, you know, somebody ought to have been like, oh, the guys. Uh, well, I'm glad you feel that way because it's true. <laughs> he just said uh, um, uh, we need to. Somebody's gonna well, kill him, and we're just. In fairness to. The, the text and the context, uh, he just says he's going to be betrayed. That doesn't, doesn't say kill. That doesn't. That that can mean an awful lot of things. You, you can betray me if I tell you a secret and you tell your brother. Yeah. And somebody here at the table is going to betray me. And you know, if we all know at the table who's who's the person that's a little bit less. I guess it's focused we on know Jesus. The outcome. It's a little we'll hindsight twenty twenty. Yeah. But again, it's we're spending every day with each other. Every other day, Peter goes, I'm, I know what I'm talking about. And everybody's like, oh, Peter doesn't really know what he's talking about. And you're talking behind each other's backs, and you're being people. And, and Peter goes, who's going to betray him? And one of the reasons Peter starts saying, it, saying that is because Peter has his own doubts about himself, which we, if we read all of that, because we don't need to read all of that, we know that story a little bit. What we miss is it's showing us a snapshot of exactly who we are as people. You know? I don't know you as well as I should. And one day you come to me and said, you know, that guy, I, I know he's he's going to totally backstab us. And I'd be like, well, that's not good. It's not like I'm going to go, how dare you? You're going to backstab me. Oh, no. We go, oh, so bad. you think? I don't think so. You, you keep it quiet and you stay calm about it and you avoid it. At least that's the rational way of reading. Well, it's the, it's the rational in... We're so caught up in ourselves and what we think about ourselves that we don't bring it up. We don't focus on it. And Jesus himself had just washed all of their feet, gave all of them communion, and explained it, and said, I just want to let you guys know that someone's going to betray me. And Peter, John, who's it going to be? What's it going to be? Whoever I give this bread to is going to betray me. Oh. You know what? I think I'm better than you. And that was a conversation, and that's where it went. Right then. I mean, I get it, but still, it's just like... Uh, it, okay, so you're just leaving that alone. Well, the, when, when, when you read it, and, and I had to have... So I had to hear this said to, to, to actually put it together, but, um, you know, Peter motions to John mm -hmm. 
to ask who it was. I and John that's, that's John that's leans back and goes, who is it? It's not like, hey, who's it going to be? Lay it out here so we can string him up. <laughs> right. Know? It's it's like so it may have been only John that heard it, yeah. and not even Peter heard who it was. No one cared enough to go, "Hey, Jesus, who's it gonna be?" They went, "Hey, who's it gonna be?" They, they didn't even care enough to really care enough. And reasonably speaking, Jesus probably whispered it back. Yeah. And. and then he does it. No, no one notices. You see, that would make arguing. that would make more sense as to. The but whole. still, no one cared enough to really ask aloud. It it it's one of those. What gets me is you know that emphasizes your point there is even though it seems like Peter cares a little bit, he doesn't care enough to ask Jesus directly. Or the group, and Jesus is talking directly to the group when he starts. Okay, so the reason that we went over here from Romans and what we're reading about, for me, was the thing that I was missing is how much God seeks to redeem us and how much he seeks to come to us where we're at and how we're so caught up in everything else that we miss how much he comes to us. So, to bring that point up again, washes the feet, which is a great ceremony that's really, it moves you explains the blood in the body and communion and then says someone's going to betray me and I'm now going to hand them the blood in the body here it is who is he doing all of this for up to that point he's doing that for all of history he's doing that for everybody but he's also doing it for Judas he's giving Judas all that time he's giving him that that opportunity to have your feet washed by Jesus, to be explained that to be a servant first, not out for yourself. He's given, giving him the body and the blood, and he's handing him the body and the blood. Every one of those is an opportunity for Judas to go, you know what? You are Jesus. You are Lord. I am not doing this. But what does he do? He takes it, he eats it, and it says, at that moment, Satan entered him. And Jesus said to him, do, do what, what, what you need to do, do it quickly. What was everyone else doing? They were caught up in themselves. Or the moment. Or the moment. And Jesus himself was the only one still seeking it. So, the reason that I went here is because, you know, if you, if you get something given to you in another message or the Holy Spirit brings you something else, and then you see that in your own study that you're doing and your own classes you're doing it in, you're completely skipping that emphasis that's in those same verses that you're reading. Because our <laughs> Romans right now is pointing that out as well. That even up to that moment, Jesus was still trying to bring him to redemption. All the way up to that moment, he was still teaching him. And we, man, are caught up in ourselves so much that we allow one of our own friends to be taken by Satan right in the middle of our group. And this group is supposed to be about the opposite of that. It's supposed to be about when we're struggling, we can turn to each other. We can... This group of strong Christian men <coughs> missed <coughs> the fact that their friend was walked out by Satan. The only one that knew it was Jesus because everybody else was too caught up in themselves. They weren't filled with the Holy Spirit and empowered with the Holy Spirit either. So. Yeah, it's true. It I'm was before to... the Holy Spirit had come, so there was something totally missing with that. There's a, there's a component missing with that I'm piece. I'm not trying to throw money in the bus either. <laughs> no, yeah, no, but com I, yes, let's not miss that. They did not have the Holy Spirit's prompting to say, hey, hey, pay attention. But they're right there. And they were said, it was said to the group, one of you is going to betray me. Nah. They're either, is it going to be me, or they were, it's not going to be me, and I don't really care enough to really care about who it's going to really be. <sighs> so, we have the Holy Spirit. So hopefully, we're not in the same, we don't have the same level of difficulty to catch those things. But it's just a matter of doing it at this point. It's doing it and living it and I, I walking it. I often catch myself, you know, urged by the Holy Spirit to say something to someone. And I'll, I'll keep starting to walk off and, and ah, ah, 
I'm like, fine. Fine, I need to say it. Yeah. Uh, it, and we don't want to, we don't want to forget. Just do it quick. <laughs> What you need Just to do rip the band-aid right off all that what, noise. What you need to do, Rick, and do it quickly. <laughs> <laughs> wow. He just he just threw verse down on you. <laughs> we just read that. <laughs> um, but don't betray Jesus, no. Yeah, don't betray yeah. Jesus, yeah. Um, the, um, the way at which we see others... Last week, when we started the, the conversation of the might in the eye and the plank... This goes hand in hand with it. It steps one step back from that and says, God is seeking after us. If we are seeking after God, that's where we have to start. That's that's where it starts. And I mean, I could be going totally off base here, but there's another thing that you're saying, because this is what I'm catching from this too. If we have a brother or sister in Christ that is starting to slip down a slope, it's our duty to still be there for them and warn them against that. Right. And that goes hand in hand with what we're talking about, though, of how can we really do that if we aren't in line with Christ in the first place? We can't because it's so difficult for it. That's what the might, uh, uh, the might in the eye versus the plank is about, is I can't walk up to you who Satan is walking you out the door as Judas, you know. How am I going to walk up to you and convince you that you're going down the wrong path when Jesus Christ himself, which, who allowed Judas to be taken, Judas still went. We still have free will. If I reach into your eye to pull out a tiny speck and you know my failings and everything that I'm bad at, you're going to look at me as a hypocrite. I have to be in line with God. I have to speak from the place of the Holy Spirit or I'm not getting anywhere with you. But you're not saying not to approach those situations, though. Right, no. Yeah, I mean, by no means. For clarification on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That did get a little confusing. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's all good. It's all about how we say it and how we approach it to the person. Not even how. It's where we're at in the first place. Well, by say, how, I mean, as are we doing it by the Spirit or are we doing it just to be a friend? Which, although the intentions are good as being a friend, if you're truly trying to help someone out, you need the Spirit's guidance to... You know, say what needs to be said. And we can go one step back from that, and I think, and I'll let Justin say what he's going to say, but if you go one step back from that, even Jonah, completely out of the will of being a friend, led through the Holy Spirit other people to know who the Lord was. It, it, it's If you are doing what God told you to do, eventually, God does the work that's going to be done. You, you don't actually have to even like the person. I mean, if I was going to help Rick out, I could totally help him out in the Holy Spirit. But being a friend with him, it'd be m much more difficult. Right, Rick? Yeah. <laughs> okay, Professor, I still like <laughs> Oh, you want to go, Kurt? You, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, oftentimes when, when that sort of correction is offered, um, and I, I say often, I mean like a lot, like probably <laughs> at least 80% of the time, it's from a place of wanting to be right or to exercise like your knowledge or, or what, where you what, like what you know to be right. this person's wrong so you're not going to point out you're wrong and and very 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 infrequently do I ever see it uh, being exercised from a place of love and uh, and you know serious genuine consideration for the heart of the person who might be doing wrong. Um, so, you know, I've got like 30 planks in my eye, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I may still reach out to someone in love who's about to just barrel over the cliff. Right. Um, you know, and that's not necessarily hypocrisy, that's, uh, yeah. Just don't do that, you know, but often, often I see... Uh, no, no, pointy that's, hand. That I see that if you reference the Leviticus blah blah blah, blah, blah <laughs> you know, you will see that what you're doing is absolutely horrendous, and you will burn in hell. And I'm like, that's not love. That's yeah, that's, that's condemnation. That's very cynical. But if you're, you know, if you know, and you have a burden for someone that you know they weren't going down that path to begin with, but they're starting to go down a bad path and you feel burdened to do it, I feel like you should 
you know, speak to that person, approach them, be like, hey, you know, I don't want you slipping down this rabbit hole. I mean, do what you're going to do, but just know that, you know, this could lead bad places for you. And even, even just warning them, I think, is better than just standing back. Yeah. Again, if we're so caught up in ourselves, we can't even see it. That's right where you're coming from. It's if you see somebody else where they're at going down the path, then you're seeing them going down the path. The point here was nobody even saw it. Even when it was told and when it was mentioned and it was said. If your buddy comes to you and says, man, I'm having a really bad week, and you go, really? That's, that's too bad. Eh, how about... And you're thinking about whether or not you left the iron on at home. I mean, that's really that, that whole... Last, the last supper was a moment of Am I the bad guy? Huh. Let me think about myself. Let me keep thinking about myself. Not to mention while they're walking up the hill, they're singing like eight or ten songs that are talking about the the songs of the saints and the songs of uh, how God is going to deliver them. And it's all about pointing to the Passover lamb and you know, Jesus being his, he was a sacrifice for them. But yeah. Well, I'll just put it out there. Like what I was going to say earlier is, if if you see something wrong in me, you just come and talk to me. If you if I see something wrong in you, if I love you, I'm going to come and talk to you. But if we don't see things wrong in us, but then there's people that need to be brought up and more mature, then take them under your wing. I mean, that's yeah. It's that's what Paul says, you know. And and hopefully this is the group that you know, like many of us have already shared it, and then we share in private as well. I'm struggling with this. I have this problem. I'm these are the things that are really hitting me and most of the time it's man I haven't been praying about that because I didn't I've even a know very sticky situation we'll touch on here in a little bit <laughs> so that is directly related to that yeah and while I'm in the fellowship of others it might be good to get the wisdom sure sure so prayer is that yeah prayer is that starting point and how am I supposed to even know well you're supposed to be paying attention first but I thought were you saying something yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Great comedy example. <laughs> if if we don't if we don't say anything to each other, we can't read minds. And guys are guys that understand that you can't read minds. I have a little bit harder time with my wife because she wants me to read her mind all the time. But hopefully, if you have that issue with with not caring what other people feel or what other people think or whether or not they're burning towards sin or not saved you bring it up to us now but I think all of us are people who care about our brothers equivalently you know we want everyone else to succeed we want to that was very man, meandering to what I just said but the reality is is I don't think any of us are people who would go I don't really care about you and I don't really want to care about you right so if we're the opposite of that then it should be as simple as saying we all care about one another we all want each other to do well we all want each other to go down the path that God wants for us and so if you're I'll not you, I'll do you one further I this might sound like a kind of a chick thing to say but I want people to care about me yeah no <laughs> I mean yeah, like yeah. Yep. as far as if I'm faltering or, or, or just what happens to me, that kind of thing. I care about you, Rick. Yeah. Gosh, thanks, Tom. I'm genuine for one. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> and here, here's, the, here's the thing for that, too, is, is Karen, when Karen and I were discussing this, because I, you know, I, I bounce stuff off of my wife all the time, and, and you know, we went down a lot of rabbit holes of, well, how much do you, are you supposed to carry other people? And so how much, you know, it, well... You know, you're supposed to love your neighbor more than you love yourself. You're supposed to, you know, and there's all all that. I thought it was love your neighbor as yourself. Which means you have to love yourself. The key there is you have to love yourself to be able to love your neighbor. Yeah, you can't just be burnt out. And that's kind of hard to do. It's easier to just tend to love your neighbor and not really like yourself. I, th I think there's exhortations like <clears throat> consider, don't think too highly of yourself than you are yeah. and to do what's but to still appreciate, everyone. you know, the work that God has created in you, right. not wake up hating your life if and I still smiling on me. I'm going to get a good night's sleep. I'm going to make sure I work and take care of my, my wife and my kids. But then if I have good balance at home, you can't even be a leader in the church unless you have a good home. 
and then if that gets out of kilter, you need to step back. And so, I mean, there's a lot of guidelines like Timothy and Titus's letters that remind us that it's an ongoing. Mm -hmm. And I've heard of elders that step back because their daughter was rebellious or their son or whatever it may be. So it's also a living thing. I mean, there may it's be a times moving times thing with seasons. Moving, yeah, like their seasons. And I hope that we're always progressing to get better, but there may be times where someone just needs to be called out. And, like I said, if you make a, if you're, you're, you know, the one thing is if you're in a lifestyle sin, like we talked about in chapter one, and you are bent on that, and John, first John, he says, if any man sins, he does not know God. If someone does willfully says, I'm just going to live a lifestyle that's contrary to God's teaching, his, his, his heart, and that's a very questionable place, a very, you know, terrible place to be in. But, you know, to sin and miss the mark a couple times or, you know, but your heart's trying and that's different. I mean, so I, I know that there's a lot of teachings there that the apostles by the Holy Spirit and that Jesus gave us to let us know that you're going to fall. Because even in that same context, he says, when you sin, yes. confess your sins one to another. Um, it, it wasn't a matter of. It doesn't mean try to sin. It just, no, it just means, means if you, you when know, you're gonna sin, whether you. Yeah, and then when you uh, sin, yeah. restore brother. Or when someone's not sin, or or confess your sins one another, bear each other's burdens. And he says, so fulfill the law of Christ. So the law of Christ is to bear each other's burdens, <coughs> to be authentic, and yeah. All That's not say. very common in today's society. It needs I, to be common in the church. But. What, Rick? I sin so much without trying. I, I would, I, I shudder to think what would happen if I actually tried. <laughs> right, if you chose to go towards it. <laughs> and and That's if what you scares me about my friend. If you look at the the room with with Judas, and you look at the room as in the people in the room, and if you were just to take you know, and and Bruce the other day was bringing this up that you know Satan is not omniscient. He is one being. He is one. He purposely came for Judas. He himself. We don't know what else spiritually was going on in that room. We don't know the demons that were in the room. We don't know the angels in the room that were fighting. We don't know behind that curtain that we can't see past. But if you fall back to the most, the most primitive version, if there are no other demons affecting any of the other men in the room, if they are all being protected by angels at that moment, we fall back to their own sin nature, their own I'm about me nature. That's where I like to start. Because if I'm being attacked by demons and they're oppressing me and pulling me towards bad choices, I, I have to be prayed up. I have to be in a place where I'm being oppressed. I like to think of this as an example of me at my basis with no demon attacking me. Do I choose to make choices to pay attention to others or do I choose to only think about myself? Right? That's where I want to be. Because at that point, I better be able to just be able to think about others and be a servant to others without any oppression. Because if oppression comes, how the heck do I have a chance to even stand up against it? If I can't even, if I can't even choose in my heart of hearts to go the right route, how am I going to stand up to a demon coming and attacking me? I mean, the Holy Spirit's there, of course, to... But my own flesh says, I don't really care about Kurt. I really don't. I, I care more about this Dr. Pepper than I do about Kurt. Had to be said. Right, right? And if that's who I am at a base level, I need to be focusing on being a better, owning my own self to know who I am. Am I really that person? If I'm that person, I should be focusing on God even more every day to say, I in my own nature, which we all know we are selfish in our own nature, I in my own nature am even farther gone than I would have thought because I can't go to that. And that's what this showed me. You've got Peter, the guy that walked on water, not caring about his friend to the point of somebody who's portraying Jesus, I don't, I don't really care. I'm, I don't really care at all. At this moment, I don't care. I just had my feet washed by Jesus. I feel like something must have been going on. Well, no, I mean, and, and then that's where like we go. After you bringing that up, it's just like, wait a second. Yeah, he, he, he didn't just get his feet washed. They all had a really good uh, spiritual moment there. 
and we're, oh, we get caught up in other things. And so if there was a bunch of oppression going on in the room with other demons and other things, and Jesus was just letting everyone be sifted, it doesn't say that. So we don't know that. But I like to start at the base. Because if I start at the base, then I can look at myself and go, am I that guy? Rick says he's having a hard week. Do I, am I really listening to Rick say he's had a hard week? Without a demon going, stop paying attention to him, stop paying attention to him, you know? Or am I just that guy that goes, I really don't care, Rick. I'm going to act like I do. Right? I don't want to be that guy. But let's focus on, on the positive end. We're filled with the Holy Spirit. Jesus says, yes, listen. Yeah, he's, he's sitting there talking to us. Pay attention. Love yeah. Like you said, they didn't have the Holy Spirit. So we have that extra, that extra oomph. I can't just look at my basis, uh, the base self of me. I'm, I'm gonna, that doesn't do me any good. I gotta say, fill me with your Holy Spirit so I can see what you see, see from your perspective, and compare myself to Christ. I mean, but I'm, there's nothing good in me. That's what Paul says here. So, um, it's like it's like the people in the world that choose to be morally right. If we start from a place as Christians where we have the Holy Spirit and we've repented and we've done all those things. But we're still a lot like Jonah in the, I really don't like those people. I really don't care about those people. You need more of his love in your heart. That's right. So you got to seek after, why am, I, why am I like this? I don't know why half the time. I just say, God, give me love. <laughs> There's no why. Help this, help, help this not be There's like no, this. Who, what, where, when, why. So I don't care. If it's terrible, give me you. Or get, you know, clean my heart like David said. Search me, know me, and create <laughs> me a clean heart. So... Very true. Okay, so that all has to do with what we're reading again in 1 through 4, uh, chapter 2, 1 through 4, and the end of 4 in Romans, which was, Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and longsuffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? The whole moment with Judas was a moment where Jesus was still seeking after his repentance. And he had no fishing buddies. He had nobody there with him to say, why are you talking to Jude? Is something wrong with Judas? What's wrong, Jude? You, are you going to betray him? Why are you going to betray him? And do you think if you know some of them were with in that circle and on that side of things, and you know were sitting there asking Judas stuff and trying to be supportive, do you think it would have had a different outcome? I mean, not. I, John knew. John knew, and John did nothing. Right, and that's all conjecture. And again, it's it's one of those things where prophecy said that it had to come to that point. That's what I was going to say. You, yeah, you can say if, but, but the point is, is it never would have. It never would have because it needed to happen that way. But I almost feel like Judas was kind of screwed. Well, and 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 I I like to think because he's like almost like a pawn. Yeah. Here's, here's the thing. I would take that logic and run with it for a little while. He didn't have to commit suicide. Yeah, he didn't have to kill himself he in the end. He could have repented after he betrayed Jesus, and he did not. Did did he, did he know in his mind, uh, you know, uh, forgetting a, for a second that this was all prophesied, did he know in his mind that Jesus was, you know, the Son of God? Okay. He didn't stay alive long enough to see the resurrection. Yeah. But, That's the tragic thing. But here's the thing for Judas, and this this is just conjecture. I just from, find hard to believe that he would do what he did for thirty can I pieces you? of silver. <laughs> can I answer you now that you've asked? Sorry. <laughs> yeah. So, Judas was a fanatical uh, a fanatical Jew, and he wanted the the Messiah of war to come back. He wanted the Messiah of okay, right. I'm going to wipe all these people out that are against Israel. That's who he expected Jesus to be. So he had been watching all this time, and I and a pastor is a couple pastors have actually I've heard go down this path of, you know what, he's not being the Messiah that I want him to be. Maybe I can make him be the Messiah I want him to be and make a little cash. And if he's not Messiah, I'm going to make a little cash. Right? He's seen a Jesus of love, not a Jesus of. You deserve my wrath and my righteous indignation, and I'm going to destroy all of you. And he's been living with that for three years, going, and then this is the week 
that they walk in with the triumphant entry with the palm leaves. And we always like to make it look like it's like, oh, it's a beautiful, sweet thing with palm leaves that make us all have fans on us. Palm leaves were a symbol of their, their nation. It was a political statement. It was like them waving the red, white, and blue. This is Jesus come back to give us back Israel and destroy all of our enemies. Yeah, but, but the logic there, if, if Judas created the situation and, 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 and Jesus turns out to be this wrathful, like, I mean, who do you think the first person he's going to turn his wrath on would be? Oh, Judas. This is what you wanted? Well, this is what you got. Like, wow. Really? He's not done. Like, he is a Jew. He's a Jew of Jews. He is a righteous Jew of Jews. He is believing that God is not moving the direction that he should be moving, just like all of the old Jews in the Old Testament believed. They were expecting things to happen all the time because they told it to happen. I just think he was an evil dude. But yeah. I would like to see him in heaven, but you know, he just, I don't know. When you seal your questionable faith with suicide, it's a question mark. Yeah, it's a big question mark. But uh, I would say I'm not so sure that he was a zealot. I know Simon was a zealot. I don't know if Judas was a zealot, but I know that. I hear yeah. that word. Remember, remember, did remember did, that is. did that, Judas die a Jew or did he die a Christian? I, I don't. He, he we don't know. Show us any repentance. That he repented and believed, and that was the message of the kingdom. Repent and believe. Jesus started his kingdom. He said, "Repent." I think he repented, but he did so with such guilt. That's why he committed it's suicide. Question, we'll find out. Yeah, it, it says he was remorseful and he tried to throw the money back. We'll find out. But, but almost all the suicides he have recorded. He, he he gave the money yeah, back. back. They just didn't take it. But that's what they both they bought the field, field of blood. With it and, yeah. and, and I'm not and his judge, and his executioner, or anything. I have no idea. But I don't want to live in that type of question mark and betray Jesus willfully. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But you look at the suicides in Scripture, or the hangings, I should say, in Scripture. Haman was hung. Mm -hmm. uh, they never David's are in line. Himself because it was actually... Uh, Solomon's mom, Bathsheba's grandpa, uh, Ahithophel, gave advice to Absalom when Absalom rebelled against David. And Ahithophel was one of David's closest friends, uh, Bathsheba's grandpa. Can you imagine having an affair with one of your best friend's granddaughter? <laughs> and then so terrible. he never let it to rest. And once Absalom rebelled against David, yep. Ahithophel tried to counsel Absalom to go attack David. Like he had a vendetta, kill the guy. And David was kind of a type of Christ. Well, he pl planned the murder, and then another Hushai or somebody gave advice to Absalom and said, No, David's a mighty warrior. He'll attack you if you attack him. And David was like a dog with his tail between his legs. So he delayed a couple weeks, and David got stronger. And then Absalom attacked him, and Joab ended up killing Absalom. He stuck him in the heart with three spears, hung him from a tree with his hair. Uh, but the point was, Ahithophel, when he found out that Absalom didn't take his advice, he made a gallows and hung himself. Haman was hung from the, the gallows that he wanted to hang Mordecai or Mordecai from. Um, I think it was one or two other hangings, and they were really bad omens. So They're all bad, not in the will of God moments. <laughs> and I say that because I, I that I just peculiar to me because I mean, that's not the way to go. I mean. And then look at Peter, he betrayed him to a, a little girl, servant girl, and all these other people, but at the same time, he saw Jesus. And one of the Gospels that says he locked eyes of Jesus right after he denied him. That, that would, that would be that would So he was shivers. convicted, where the other one was guilt. This was conviction, I'm convinced. I don't ever want to do that again. Where a guilt, or satanic guilt, is to drive you from the cross, drive you from Jesus, to drive you into this inward shame of I am no good, instead of I, what I did was no good. Yeah. Or I made a mistake. I am a mistake, or I am. And so we're not about shame. We're about conviction, and that's what Jesus preached that. And then you know, you look at the. Here's the only other last thing I'll say about Jesus. When the woman broke the alabaster box in oil and she anointed Jesus' feet, Judas in Most the like, yeah. John says, "Why was not this money?" I mean, it names, it's about money. Names him out in the Gospel of John, not the other Gospel, but Judas. It says explicitly. Why didn't she sell this oil and give the proceeds to the poor? You know, what a waste. And Jesus says, you leave her alone, because this will be written of her for many generations to come, and the poor you will always have with you. 
So he didn't get Jesus' message. Jesus' message was not to set up any political game. So in some sense, but he's greedy. And in Jude, we have all these warnings against false apostasy and teaching. And it talks about the error of Balaam. Balaam sold out the whole people of Israel, and a donkey had to rebuke him. Because oh, so that's destroyed. actually the other ver one of the other ones that I have. Because he's so greedy. So the point here is it's God's goodness that leads us to repentance. And I mean, you've got love for the money, love for money, and you're going to pierce, you're pierce through with many sorrows. And the Antichrist will come to power, and all these different things that Revelation talks about. A lot of them are money, and greed, and power, and and there's no conviction better than Jesus Christ having washed your feet, shown you communion, and handing you bread and saying, one of you is going to betray me. <laughs> Looking you in the eye and handing you the bread. If at that moment he didn't go... And then he betrayed him with a stinking kiss. And a kiss. You had an insult to injury. And that's what he said. You're betraying me with a kiss? No, 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 no. Oh, Jesus, he ran over the hill. Go get him, <laughs> Go get him guys. Okay. They didn't, they didn't even know who Jesus was, and he had to kiss them just to show them who Jesus was. He double betrayal. It's just terrible. It's, yeah. All right. So let's let's go back over to um, Second Peter. Look how kind Jesus was. Dude. Yeah, exactly. He he the kindness leads to his goodness. Look how good God was. To Jesus. We're gonna go to Second Peter three. And you aren't good to God. Justin, go ahead and read there at three. Second Peter three three. Three three. Second Peter three. And 8 and 9 are the, the keys here, but I wanted to make sure we had all the other context. Second Peter 3.3 3. <clears throat> Knowing this verse, as scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lust, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willfully forget that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of water and in the water by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of God ungodly men. But, beloved, do not forget this one thing, that the Lord, with him, the Lord, one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but he is long suffering but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt away with a fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for the hastening of the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with a fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to the, his promise, look for the new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. There, therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found in him in peace, without spot and blameless. And consider that long suffering of our Lord, the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, as also our beloved Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you as also in all of his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction, as they do the rest of the scriptures. You therefore, beloved, since you have you know this beforehand, beware, lest you also fall from your own steadfastness, being led away with from the error of the wicked, or with the error of the wicked, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. The, the, the points that I, I really wanted to, to hit home here are, yeah, we're, damnation is what's supposed to come, but we're supposed to be steadfast. We're supposed to be long, we're supposed to be paying attention to what God's going to do. He's growing long, in growing in His grace. We're supposed to be doing what God showed us how to do. Thief in the night. You know, the, ready. the day of Judas coming and taking Jesus was a thief in the night moment. It was, the it's night time. works the same way. <coughs> but the thief in the night strange. Peter's talking about is, you know, say peace and safety and sudden destruction will come upon them. Right. Like the and they were all sitting there going, palm leaves, yeah, you know, day before, everything's great, we're great, everything's great, Jesus the Messiah is here, everything's great, and bam, it's over. And that's what it says in Isaiah, that 
uh, three and a half, like three years into his ministry, that he will be cut off. If you look at Isaiah, I think it's chapter two, when Jesus, when he pulled up the scroll in the Gospel of Luke, he pulled out the scroll and he said, "I have come uh, to preach the good news to the poor, uh, you know, set captives free." And then he stops in the middle of the passage. He says, "Declare the year of the Lord." The very next part of that verse says, "And the vengeance and they made of it. our God," and and on and on. But if you look at Daniel too, it says that this shoot will be cut off and cut short. And so we've been in this age of, of of time where God has turned His focus from Israel. And look at all those Christians that are Gentiles that are in the kingdom. But then it says, in the last days, scoffers will come and say, "Oh, when's He coming? He's not coming. And Jesus is coming." And we'll be surprised. It'll it'll be a surprise, yeah. just like it was for them. Just like the flood. And just like we're not keeping but will up. Will it be a surprise for us? Yes. No, we should, well, we should be ready. We should be no, ready, but it'll still be a surprise. <laughs> because nobody knows. Nobody knows when it's going to happen. How are you know if not? Yes. But be ready and steadfast. But and we so we should just all keep our mouths shut. <laughs> Wow! Not claim to know <laughs> when it's gonna happen, and then it'll happen. <laughs> I don't claim to know the squat, but I know we have all the signs of labor pains, and so it's just ramping up, ramping up. Um, but with that being said, it says they will say peace and safety, and sudden destruction will come upon them. But for us, we should not be caught unaware, for we know the times and the seasons, as Paul says. So we know it's coming. A lot of people think it's Pope. I, I, I'm not I naming it, but I, I know think that it's ramping up. It's ramping up, ramping up. I think that's why why people, uh, particularly Christians, are so uh, so uh, uh, fervent about pointing out who the next, who the who the, the next, yeah. who the anti. No, that that's a good that's a good way of saying it because it seems to be back to back. Yeah. Nope, wasn't this guy? Who, who's who's who the antichrist is because they want the antichrist to be like on earth because if the antichrist is on earth. Jesus coming. Then the end is nigh. He probably the Muslims are want the same thing. They yeah. want their God, They're which is the Holy Antichrist. They're praying for him. No. I don't. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. All right. Let's I, rein it in. I've got a <laughs> none of that. none of this matters. Yeah, it does. It well, does he said, "Be ready." If yeah. we're not ready, that's where I was going. Right. right. We're not even. We're we're supposed to be knowing all these things we're talking about and be ready encourage each other as you see the day. And that's where we start. And if, if we're not focused on Christ and being ready and who we are, and we're focused on I think it's that guy, then you're kind of missing the point of focus on who we are and where we are and what we're doing with each other. I think it's that guy. I just, I think. I don't care. I, I hope it's that guy. <laughs> I don't care if it's that guy, because if my buddy next to me doesn't have Christ, what does that matter? What what does matter is knowing the times and being wise mm. and to make the best of your time, like you said. The make night, the best the of your time. The night is coming when no one can work. And that's we're going to get the same wages as someone who comes in in the last hour. That's fine. Right. I mean, we're going to have eternal life. That's, that's all Don't we have seniority? <laughs> Don't we have seniority? <laughs> but, and any rewards we get, we'll cast right back at his feet. But I think his goodness leads us to repentance. We should use that goodness to warn other people and say, yes, get ready. And you've been warned, and I love you, and Jesus loves you. He died on the cross for your sins. And just turn from your wicked ways, believe in him, live for him, and let him change your life. Okay, have a good day. We'll see you. Yeah. And hey, Jesus <laughs> and he died on the cross. He loves you. He, well, and, and I'd like to look at it from the, the viewpoint again of Paul. The end is right here. It's tomorrow. He's ready. He's ready every moment of every day. We should be. As we should be. Every moment of every day. And if we're not, and we're not focusing on that, we're missing the point. Um, let's go over to Isaiah real quick and get that one out of the way. And we'll actually be all the verses today done. So, Isaiah chapter 30. Doug, uh, go ahead and read uh, 30, 15. Can I say something real quick? Sorry. Sure, sure, go ahead. First John 3, 3 talks about when we shall be like him when we see him, for we will see him as he is. Um, we shall be like him, basically. But it says there in First John 3, 3, it says, He who has this hope purifies himself as he is pure. So when you're looking forward to being with the Lord, and you're looking forward to him. Toward the end and where you're going to be. The end, and, and if he's going to call us home, if there's going to be a rapture and all that. You're looking forward to that. You have that hope. It purifies you. It gives you an urgency, but it also gives you a proper perspective of uh, 
Uh, yep. First John three three. Three three. three. Yep. Yeah. Doug, there thirty verse fifteen. Uh, this is what the sovereign Lord, the Holy One of Israel, says: Only in returning to me and resting in me will you be saved. In quietness and confidence is your strength, but you would have none of it. You said, No, we will get our help from Egypt. They will give us swift horses for riding into battle. But the only swiftness you are going to see is the swiftness of your enemies chasing you. One of them <laughs> will chase a thousand of you, five of them will make all of you flee. You'll be left like a lonely flagpole on a hill or a tattered banner on a distant mountaintop. So the Lord must wait for you to come to him so he can show you his love and compassion. For the Lord is a faithful God. Blessed are those who wait for his help. O people of Zion who live in Jerusalem, you will weep no more. He will be gracious if you ask for help. He will surely respond to the sound of your cries. Though the Lord gave you adversity for food and suffering for drink, he will still be with you to teach you. You will see your teacher with your own eyes. You will, you, your own ears will hear him. Right behind you, a voice will say, This is the way you should go, whether to the right or to the left. Then you will destroy all your sil silver idols and your precious gold images. You will throw them out like filthy rags, saying to them, Good riddance. Then the Lord will bless you with rain at planting time. There will be wonderful harvests and plenty of pasture <laughs> land for your livestock. The oxen and donkeys... All right, we can go down through his blessings forever because it's great. But the point again is if we're focusing on God, we turn back to God, he is always seeking us. He is always going to bring us back to the way we should go. He will bring us back to repentance. He will bring us back to whether or not we should go to the left or the right. It goes all the way back to Isaiah that they really, I mean, it's before Isaiah that they pointed out, but I wanted to bring us back to like where in verse 18, therefore the Lord will wait that he may be gracious to you, and therefore he will be exalted that he will may have mercy on us. For the, In that moment, he was having mercy on Judas. We went down that road. We need to go down that road some more about whether or not Judas was made to fail. Because I, I am not a guy that believes in predestined destruction. I'm a guy that believes in God knows how we are, and he knew Judas was never going to repent. There's a big difference between that and not giving him the opportunity to repent. It's just like saying, oh, look, Zoe is, is going to, Zoe's not going to give that candy that she just got to Nathan. She's not going to do it. Zoe, don't you think it'd be nicer for you to give that candy to Nathan? And she doesn't give it to Nathan. I mean, it's not that hard for me to figure that out most of the time. And, man, I would love it if she proved me wrong. That's how God is to us, I believe. God's thoughts and intelligence is so much higher than our intelligence that he knew Judas's heart, his true heart, all the way along the way. Doesn't mean he still didn't go, please surprise me. Please, please, please surprise me. And when you look at the Pharaoh, the same thing, made for destruction, the concept of him being made for destruction, can you try any harder to change somebody's mind than the plagues? But instead of that, you know, God hardened his heart. On the ninth plague. You're, you're missing the points of all the other plagues. Up to that point, he hardened his own. Actually, it's the seventh plague. He hardened his own heart all the way up to that point. Right. God came in and goes, let my people go. And he goes, not going to do it. Let my people go. And he does it all those plagues. And then finally he says, you know what? You had your chance. Heart's hardened. You don't have a choice anymore. Okay, I see where that goes. So he still gave him the opportunity all the way up to the end. And 100%, Satan was not in Judas until Judas took the food and ate it. So Judas still had his own will to go, I'm not doing this. Boy, that would have been an incredibly weird moment. But Jesus knew his heart. God knew his heart. Do you think that Judas didn't see everything everybody else saw for three years? To have an opportunity to believe in Jesus? He saw everything else. He was in the boat. He was in the boat. That's a great line. That's a great statement. I should just remember, man, if I was in the boat, would I have missed the point of being in the boat? And that's what Judas did. He missed the point. That's why I like to think of him as... 
he wanted a militaristic Jesus bringing fire down and rain. And he went through the palm leaves and saw it as, these people are, are, are saying this guy's awesome, and I think he stinks because he's not the Messiah that I was expecting. I'm going to let him die. Either that, or the guy's going to show up and pound everybody. Oh, look, he's dying. He doesn't even know about the resurrection. Right? What were we going to say, Kurt? Um, well, you know, we know how Peter and Andrew and John and James and Matthew came to came to be in Jesus' crew. The rest of them aren't really mentioned. They just right. list them off. And uh, there's a movie called Judas where Judas first encounters Jesus as he's freaking out and flipping over the money changer tables in the temple. And he's like driving him out with a whip and, and that's like where Judas is depicted as first meeting Jesus. I so was always he, under the impression that, that the twelve were with him well before that time. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say it, but we we just conjecture it, and it, it we don't and, know and one way or the other. Comes along way after that, uh, if you go chronologically. Well, you know. Unless, of course, they're they're you know the they're getting at from the from the, the, G, the Judas scroll. That, <laughs> But we don't know. We don't know when they were all picked up and at, at the same at, at the time periods on the same dates. It just lists them off. Right. So. 